Hello. Uh, for uh, this particular episode, we're going to talk about uh, the regulation of emotions and uh, how uh, habituation is involved in a particular kind of mechanism of habituation is involved in the regulation of emotions. Uh, but before we talk about regulation of emotion, we should talk about regulation in general. So what's the point of regulating anything? The point of regulating it, uh, something is to maintain it at an even keel. I mean, the most obvious thing that we regulate is uh, the temperature in our, uh, in our uh, apartment or house, uh, a classroom at the university. Uh, temperature in a university classroom is set uh, about 72 degrees. And how is that regulation of temperature achieved? Well, if the temperature drifts up, that activates opponent mechanisms, namely the pumping in cold air, which brings the temperature down. And if the temperature gets too cold in the wintertime, that activates opponent processes that drive, pump in warm air to drive the temperature up. So uh, temperature regulation in a classroom, temperature regulation in a physical body, a uh, similar kind of thing uh, operates through opponent mechanisms. If, you, if things start to drift up, you activate these opponents to force it down. If things are drift too low, you activate mechanisms that bring it back up. And uh, with these opponent mechanisms, we can achieve a pretty precisely regulated temperature. In the case of the human body, what's the normal temperature? It's it's 98.6. So normal temperature is specified uh, to the tenth of a degree of Fahrenheit. It is a very uh, uh, high level of precision. Well, so how, do, how are emotions regulated? Same deal, through opponent mechanisms. If you get really excited, uh, that uh, activates mechanisms to, that will uh, counteract that excitement and bring your level of excitement down. Uh, so uh, if we may, uh, oh, we have the first slide up. So emotions are regulated, and these uh, 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 this regulation is achieved through activation of opponent processes. And the other thing that's interesting about, about the regulation of emotions and the, the particular theory of regulation that I'm going to describe today the opponent process theory is that regulation uh, gets uh, more and more effective with practice. That is, the more often you activate an emotion, uh, the better your physiology becomes in counteracting that emotion. Okay? And it does so by making the opposing process, the counteracting force, stronger and uh, uh, allows it to be activated uh, more rapidly. So let's look at the next slide, which um, illustrates what's called the standard pattern of affective dynamics, which uh, is uh, illustrates uh, the pattern of emotions that you get the first time you encounter an emotional event. Let's say the emotional events is uh, you're, uh, you have a friend of yours who's going to come visit you for the weekend and you haven't seen this person now uh, in a, a couple of years and you're really excited to see them. And uh, I, this was your best friend in high school and uh, you're really looking forward to the visit. Uh, the visit takes place uh, uh, in the shaded part of the uh, pattern that's illustrated on the slide. Uh, when uh, you f first encounter, you pick up your friend at the airport, uh, there's a huge uh, uh, jump in uh, positive affect. You get really excited, happy, uh, joyous, uh, but you can't maintain that forever. <laughs> so it kind of, you can't maintain that for the whole weekend. You know, the whole weekend is not as exciting as the first 10 minutes that, that, that you meet up with your friend. And so there's a little bit of an adaptation and uh, you get the stable state until the visit ends, which is at the end of the, that shaded area. Now, uh, visit ends when your friend leaves. Now, when your friend leaves, uh, assuming that everything <laughs> went well during the visit, 
do you return to do you return to normal? You know, your friend leaves, uh, you take him back to the airport, he flies off. Uh, uh, do you then, you know, go back to your room and uh, do your homework, uh, uh, go about your business as if nothing happened? Well, pretty unlikely. That is when your friend, uh, an exciting emotional experience like this, there's going to be a longing. There's going to be a, a degree of sadness. Uh, and that's a reflection of the opponent or the opposite process that gets activated. Uh, and that takes a while to uh, kind of decay, which and you see the decay of the opponent process as the curve goes off uh, to the right. Now let's uh, go to the next slide which shows you uh, what uh, your emotions are like. Uh, just imagine this experiment where you're, um, after this first visit, turns out your uh, friend came into a lot of money, has a lot of time on his hands, and so he comes to visit you every weekend. <laughs> right? Well, if he comes to visit you every weekend, when you first pick him up at the airport, you're gonna be glad to see him but you're not going to be anywhere near as excited as you were the first time he came to visit. And you're going to fall into a kind of a normal routine that doesn't involve a lot of euphoria and happiness and joy and excitement and so on. And uh, that's what's illustrated by the A minus B uh, graph uh, uh, in the slide during the, in the shaded area. And uh, the reason this, uh, uh, the emotions are no, the emotions become regulated. That is, our body is set up so that we, uh, it, it doesn't tolerate big swings and happiness and sadness and whatever emotions. Uh, any uh, large emotional shift is going to activate an opposing mechanism that is going to bring that uh, is, counteract that emotion, bring you back to back to normal. Uh, there have been a lot of studies about uh, oh, what uh, are the psychological roots of happiness. <laughs> yeah. And uh, everybody wants to be happy, right? Uh, what the opponent process theory of motivation tells you is you can't be deliriously happy all the time. <laughs> That just doesn't happen. You know, even if uh, uh, you, you, marvelous things happen to you, uh, uh, the opponent mechanism gets activated. So these marvelous experiences get dampened with repetition and it's going to start to feel like normal. And so uh, if you uh, look at the overall level of happiness, of someone who uh, makes $50,000 a year versus someone who makes $250,000 a year. There, you might think, you know, somebody's making $250,000, they can buy all kinds of gadgets and go out to eat, eat a lot and uh, get a lot, a lot of toys and cars and boats and <laughs> whatnot. Uh, maybe you have a vacation house and so they're gonna be a lot more happy. Well, they're not, because <laughs> uh, even if you have the boats and the vacation house and all of those things, it's it's a big thrill uh, the first time you go to your vacation house and maybe the second or third, uh, but then uh, the opponent mechanisms kick in and it becomes less and less of a thrill and you return to kind of your baseline normal uh, emotional state. Uh, now, one of the things that happens as you become habituated to a, an emotional stimulus, and if we may go back to that previous slide, one of the things you'll notice uh, 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 with this habituated pattern is once the stimulus is off, the after effect is much bigger and lasts longer. So one of the things that happens uh, uh, if you have a lot of experience with an emotion arousing event is if it's taken away from you, it's not that you show a great deal of enjoyment of uh, your boat, <laughs> but if you lose your boat, <laughs> you become really unhappy. It's the loss of the boat that, that's uh, critical. 
Uh, okay, so these general mechanisms uh, have uh, operate with respect to all kinds of emotions, and they are particularly relevant in the case of drug addiction. Uh, in the case of drug addiction, an individual takes a drug and he feels really a lot more, uh, whatever the drug effect is, he, he feels euphoric, okay? Oh, what happens the second time you take the drug? Well, you feel less euphoric. <laughs> and uh, the third time, it, the euphoria gets less and less and less you get uh, uh, the development of, we, of tolerance, which is a type of habituation to the drug itself. And that development of tolerance or habituation to the emotional effects of the drug is due to the buildup of this opponent mechanism to, that fights any deviation uh, from your normal emotional state. And the more often you take the drug, the more effect this opponent process becomes in counteracting the euphoria produced by the drug. And after a while, there is no euphoria because the uh, opponent mechanism is uh, totally uh, takes hold. Now, if you may look at the next slide, this is a this shows you a uh, uh, it's a, a summary of the emotional effects of taking heroin. And this is a slide that was uh, created by uh, George Koob, which, who is a prominent uh, neuroscientist studying drug addiction. And he shows that each time you take heroin, you get this spike in uh, euphoria, uh, sense of well-being, which decays. You take the drug again and it goes back up. But uh, how far up it goes uh, decreases with repetitions of the drug. And then uh, after a about uh, uh, 10 administrations, uh, you had to glance over the slide. You don't take the drug anymore. Well, if you don't take the drug, then the opponent mechanism uh, is what becomes really evident. And if the drug made you feel good, the counteracting emotion is a, a feeling of anxiety and, and dysphoria. You feel particularly bad. And uh, at that point, uh, you may feel so bad that you're looking for any way to, uh, it's not that not taking the drug returns you to normal. Normal becomes taking the drug with the opponent mechanism. If you miss taking the drug, you've experienced the impact of the opponent, which drives you into a really negative emotional state. And uh, the quickest way to get out of that is to re-administer the drug. And so uh, a lot of uh, uh, drug addicts uh, are trapped into the situation where they have to use the drug in order to uh, turn off the dysphoria and the, the aversive emotions that occur with abstinence uh, the only way to get rid of that is to wait long enough for that to dissipate. And that may take weeks and months and, and uh, uh, a very long time. And uh, often drug addicts just simply don't have the patience for that. And they're miserable for all that time. They're miserable and they can't stand their misery. And so they re-administer the drug. So um, I think this is one of the most uh, powerful arguments against uh, repeated drug use. Repeated drug use results in an habituation effect. It results in strengthening an opponent mechanism, uh, which uh, then causes you real uh, tangible misery uh, when you don't have access to the drug. And then you end up in this uh, uh, predicament where you're taking the drug just to start feel normal, not to feel really good, just to feel normal. So uh, the euphoria that the drug initially produced never returns. You can never regain that, uh, which is what which makes it, and it seems to me kind of counterproductive. Fall into this trap. Uh, <clears throat> that's the story of the opponent process theory of motivation, and there are lots of other applications. Lots of uh, 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 lots of complication, you know, a lot of details. Uh, so I urge you to read about it, think about it as it applies to uh, 
uh, all kinds of situations, uh, personal relationships, uh, pharmacological agents, your enjoyment of food, all sorts of circumstances. It's a really powerful, broadly applicable, and remarkably insightful uh, theory that allows us to better appreciate the normalcy of human experience. That's my story for today, and I'm sticking to it. See you next time.